as we uh, mentioned at the top of the service, in addition to being um, Veterans Day today, and as I mentioned, Cheryl Dickinson is wearing her uniform of the United States Army Reserve. I'm sorry, National Guard. What did I say Army National Guard? National Guard. The uh, country thanks you. And Rabbi Khan thanks you. And I do that on behalf of Rabbi Keller, because you have spent your career serving our military, serving our forces, serving our country, and protecting us and keeping us safe. And we know you well enough to know that you are indeed not playing on your iPhone, but protecting us and keeping us safe. <laughs> and playing on your iPhone from time to time. That's the girl's job, though. But thank you, Cheryl. And for those of you in our congregation tonight, if you uh, are a veteran of any of the uh, forces, if you would please do me the honor of standing at this time. Elohenu v'lehea avotenu v'motenu, our God and God of our ancestors, we ask for your blessing upon these, thy children, for their service to our country, to the United States of America, and to its citizens. God, continue to bestow health and happiness and goodness upon them and their families so that they will continue to serve their families, their community, and their country for its safety and peace. And may they continue to be an example of excellence, of purposeful living, and of service to nation, to God, and to our blessed country. Amen. Thank you all. Did anyone do the parade today, by the way? Anyone walk in the parade? No? You should. It was such a beautiful day. There were 90 floats and cars and things this year, I hear, which is pretty not bad. I, and I love a parade. But thank you all very, very, very much. So there was also an election this week. And there's always a fear, I know, and, and, and if you remember last Shabbat, I said... Um, that I, I was very direct. If you weren't feeling melancholy um, about the election, that I don't know if you were quite thinking about what you were about to do. But I do not know many people who did not feel melancholy on Tuesday. And I don't know many people who didn't wake up on Wednesday feeling um, melancholy as well. But one of the things that I said on Yom Kippur when we talked about Lashon Tov and I was talking about that uh, presidential debate and the question um, that I think, I believe, if I remember correctly, his name was Rob Becker, um, had asked the candidates to try to sort of save the moment and have them say actually something nice about each other. Um, and we were talking about Lashon HaTov on Yom Kippur. Melancholy doesn't necessarily mean that um, uh, you're feeling necessarily awful. It means that you have taken the time to actually think about not which candidate you were going to choose, but about the way in which the presidential race was, was run. And for me in particular, and I know for many of us, we had in a way a bipolar feeling, a feeling of... Um, real melancholy, real ambivalence about uh, this election for some of us discussed with how it was conducted by both candidates and their minions. But then a feeling on Wednesday of the democracy being very much alive and that our democracy is truly a gift from God and from our founding fathers, and that at the end of the day, if we really think about it, scratch the surface a little bit, it wasn't about even this election itself or about who became president. It was about the idea of democracy being alive and having been sustained now for almost 250 years. And as I wrote to you um, on Wednesday evening, I really wanted to convey a message that nobody died, that the country did not die, that our democracy did not die, but it actually worked, whether we agreed with the outcome or not. And I think part of the problem with this election was it was so much about the two candidates and not 
at all in the way that they saw it about the people. And the people are so divided. There's that great line in that movie, The American President, about people who claim to love America, but so clearly hate Americans. Michael Douglas says it, or Annette Bening says it in the movie. And I think that what we have seen for the last, I don't know, it feels like decade, but it was 18 months, was a lot of people who claimed to love America but acted in ways and said things on both sides that so clearly, clearly articulated the fact that they hate other people who are Americans. And that's what the melancholy is about. That's what that feeling was about. But enough about me. I want to know, this is risky, so there's going to be some ground rules. I want to know what you learned from the election this week. I learned that our democracy is alive. And I didn't learn but reminded myself, or it reminded me as a Jew, that I am among the luckiest Jews to live in the history of the history of this world because I live in this country and I get a vote and I'm allowed to be a part of choosing who our leaders are because Jews, as you know, for over two millennia were not given rights or citizenship or the ability to vote. And so I consider myself to be among the luckiest Jews to ever have lived. There are two ground rules in answering this question. Number one, actually three, keep it positive. Did you see how positive I just kept it? <laughs> keep it positive. What did you learn this week? Number two, I, don't, I, would ask, I would actually prefer that you don't mention the candidates, names. Let's keep it about the country. And number three, this is a listening exercise. We're not on CNN. So if you have something not nice to say about what someone else says, keep it to yourself. <laughs> okay? We're not CNN. We're not doing that. It's Shabbat. Remember, Shabbat is the great equalizer. Shabbat is salvific. It is redemptive. So let's redeem ourselves a little bit. What did we, I'll step out here, just a few people, what did you learn this week? Steve Bandler, what did you learn this week? Uh, the Montini, the editorial, yeah. Right. So the, the E.J. E. J. Montini from the Arizona Republic wrote a piece and said, if your biggest concern is who wrote the election, don't forget there are people out there whose biggest concern are food on the table and roofs over their heads, and you're lucky. And that goes along with what I was feeling, too, as a Jew, to be very, very, very lucky. What did you learn? Yes. Uh, we happened to be in California. You were in California for election day? Tuesday. On Tuesday. Mm. They were, you know, the high school one, she, her whole group, they were in front of the crowd watching. Mm -hmm. you know, so all the kids in the high school group. So uh, what you learned is how great it was to see your grandchildren right. into, it. Really into it and excited and engaged right. in, the democ in the conversation of the democracy and with each other and staying up late and watching it. Yes, nice. Anyone else? Yes. You learn not to believe in polls. I like that because um, I have always objected to this idea of, 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 of turning people into numbers. And we learn in, in Bamidbar, in, in, the book of, uh, in the book of numbers, in the first parsha, what happens when you just sort of, in the, in the abstract, count numbers and make people into numbers and then make them into groups and then go around talking about how everyone is important and equal, but you're in this group or you're in that category or you're in this number, and it's just so antithetical to the whole thing, and so I'm glad that you said that. Yes? Yes. 
Oh, beautiful. You learned about community and how if you're divided, you really can't accomplish anything. Very nice. Yes? More people didn't vote than voted. Oh, thank you for saying that. 52%, I think, of Americans. How many? 46 of Americans decided not to vote. 46% 46 of our vote, uh, people who were, who were able to vote did not vote. Wow, you're right. And I thought about that a little bit as I was watching the numbers come in. That's sort of sad. Yes? That's a big percentage. That's almost half of the country didn't even show up. Yes? That no matter who you were rooting for, who you wanted, the nation survived, the Constitution survived, we survived through this. We want to next place. I like that. The, no matter who you voted for, who wins, who loses, the nation survives. President Obama said this on Wednesday. The sun came up today. The nation survives, the Constitution survives. And, and by the way, we can have arguments about the Electoral College and the popular vote. Um, I guarantee you that anybody who's running for president will never, ever, ever do anything about it. Um, especially if they're the winner, they will do nothing about the Electoral College. Nonetheless, it's obsolete, it's not obsolete, whatever. The Constitution survived, the system worked. Yes, Bobby. I, I trust you. you. You heard the ground rules. Everyone, by the way, so impressed. We, we learned that negative ads do not work. Huh. And that's all we heard from both sides. The negativity and the negative ads Nobody about issues. didn't work because they were about... No one wins in a negative campaign. Really, I mean, that's really, at the end of the day, no one wins because there's going to be, when, especially when the, 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 the tone is negative all around. And that, by the way, I think you're not just talking about with the presidency, but with local elections and, and yeah, yeah. I mean, we had, there were, there were other things on the ballot on Tuesday, as you know, and um, um, very important things, uh, including, you know, that, that section to, to uh, allow the 75 uh, Superior Court judges to either be retained or not. Yeah, and it was really nice to see like three congregants on that list of, of judges. I voted to retain all three of them because, <laughs> and the other ones, no. no. I never quite know what to do with that section, I guess, unless one of those judges has voted against you on something. One more, maybe one more. Sam Baker, we'll have two more. Oh. Sam? So the, 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 you learned that religious and racial hatred in this country is prevalent. Yes? I, I agree with that, but my thought was that um, I voted for the person that I was not happy with mm -hmm. so that the other candidates wouldn't get When? So you voted, it was, the, was it really the... of people who voted for the lesser of two evils, so to speak? If the, um, the news networks are Yeah. Accurate. So you voted for, you really voted against someone as opposed to for someone, which in a democracy is tricky because you would hope that you would be voting for someone. By the way, I think you're right. That, that's that ambivalent part. Like, I'm, I'm voting against someone, not necessarily for someone. I feel very American. I was not proud of I know. And, and how many people actually feel tempted not to even show up on Tuesday because... Right, but Jews know better. I hope Jews know better, especially after the 20th century, than to not show up to vote. Yes? Okay, you're the last one. I actually have some things to say, and I know, I know you've got to get to dinner, and well, so do we all. So go ahead. Yes, I, I agree. The future of the country is in some very, very, very good hands and in the hands of some incredibly articulate, passionate people who care, who are, by the way, the children of a generation who, Generation X, as a Generation Xer, are known for our ambivalence about mostly everything that hasn't anything to do with exactly us. So this idea that all kids are narcissists and they only care about themselves was found to be untrue. And it is in these protests as well, I think, uh, around the country. I want to say a couple of things. In the moment when, and I hope that this will be part of this exercise of healing, I am not uh, naive enough to think that for those people 
who did not vote for the president-elect that you're feeling very good right now or safe right now. And I am not so naive to think that those who voted um, for Hillary Clinton um, are happy with how the outcome turned out. And I'm not naive enough to think that those whose person won aren't feeling really excited and happy too, even if maybe on some level they felt like they were voting against her as opposed to for him, which was a big number of people as well. I wanted to put this in a Jewish context. I mean, I think so far we have done a great job of putting it into a Jewish context because Shabbat really is about salvation of our week, saving us from our week. There's a question asked, why did God choose Mount Sinai on the day that is stated in the Torah for giving the Torah to the Israelites? Why did God choose Mount Sinai? And um, why did God choose to give us the Torah on Mount Sinai is the question. It could have been anywhere else in the 40-year journey. It could have been in Egypt. It could have been in Israel. Why Mount Sinai? There's something in the verses in uh, Parshat Yitro and Jethro. I know we're doing Lech Lecha, but Josh is going to teach us tomorrow morning, Dean Holo, about Lech Lecha, so we'll learn that from him. Um, I don't, I don't want to ruin your, your uh, mojo over there. Uh, we learn why God on the third month, on the first day of the month, that, that's the question. And so it says in the Torah, in the Hebrew, Vayisu merafidim, vayavau midbar Sinai, vayechanu bemidbar, vayichen sham Yisrael neged hahar. And so, the, by the way, what this means is, they, our ancestors, journeyed from Rafidim, and they arrived in the wilderness at Sinai, and they encamped in the wilderness, and then it changes so we have three days there. They journeyed, they arrived, and they encamped. And then the Hebrew changes to the singular, and then it camped at the foot at the mountain. So let me put it all together. They journeyed from Rephidim. They camped in the wilderness of Sinai. And then it, Israel, singular, camped at the foot of the mountain. So a good Jewish question is, why does it go from they, plural, in the Hebrew, to the singular, it, camped at Mount Sinai? How is it that Israel became it from they? Rashi, who is a pretty decent Jewish commentator, yes, of history, asks the following question, because you answer questions with question. He said, what made us, not, it's a statement, what made us capable he says, of receiving Torah at that minute, in that place, at that time, was the moment when they became it, when we, the Israelites, became a single and united entity, became singular. When we changed from the plural to the singular is the moment that we were worthy and ready to enter into the covenant with God and become the Israelite nation and receive the covenant. And Rashi continues to say, we were ke'ishechad belevechad, that the Israelites had become like a single person with a single heart. And that's why they were deserving and ready. And so on this Shabbat, I wanted to say three quick things about this election. Because as we've all said, or implied, explicitly or implicitly, we know that our country, our nation, is not and it. We are not one. We are not united. We are united by the fundamental principles of the Constitution and our democracy, but we are not united. We are more than divided. We are tearing, cracking apart. Not just because of the tone of one election, by the way, but because of what underpins that tone. Right? We look outside in and we can see the cracks all over the place. And I, by the way, think the election was a function, a product of those cracks, the campaign at least. So the Israelites went from they to it, and our country is very much a they. I think we learned three things this week, including all these things that we talked about. And briefly, I want to say them. 
One is we can't give up on democracy in America. This is really one of the ideas that was, I feel, lost amongst Jews and in the Jewish community. I actually saw someone who had the audacity to post on Facebook this week as they were gloating about Mr. Trump winning that said, how dare the 75% of Jews who voted for Hillary Clinton vote for her. The Jews are the smartest dumb people ever. A Jew actually on social media posted an anti-Semitic statement about Jews. That is not acceptable. And I want to say to our community, to the Jewish people, that the way that many Jews have behaved has been wonderful. But the way that some Jews have behaved, just like last summer when the Iranian nuclear deal was passed, has been despicable. You cannot speak to other Jews that way and expect those Jews to A, take you seriously, and to B, respect you, be respectful of you. And I want it to stop. I want Jews to stop making those kinds of statements against other Jews. It is bad for our people, and it makes us look bad. You remember that old Yiddish expression your Bubbies and Zadie said, it's a Shonda to the Goyim. When Jews call out other Jews and call them names, it is bad for the Jews. And if you don't believe me, read your history. That is number one. Our democracy is okay. Our democracy is going to survive. Secondly, why do I know this? Because democracy in the way that we promote it as Americans is parallel to the values of Judaism. If you are pro-Jewish, then you are pro-democratic. The values of human dignity, the pursuit of justice, the idea that liberty and freedom mean that we have to be responsible. With freedom comes responsibilities. With rights comes... Res These are all Jewish concepts. The foundation of our country is the book of Deuteronomy, is the prophets, is rabbinic tradition. And so we should be very active and very engaged in our democracy. Our democracy did not die because one person won. By the way, it's the same thing that happened when George W. Bush was elected. The liberals said the very same things about him, and then those people said the same things about Barack Obama, and now those people are going back and saying these things about Donald Trump. It's the same pattern. That's the second lesson. The second lesson is that the winners this time should remember the adage of Rabbi Hillel from 2,000 years ago, what is hateful to you, don't do it to others. What is hateful to you, what has been hateful to you over these last eight years, you are not allowed to do to others. That's what Rabbi Hillel taught. That's not Steve Kahn, that's Rabbi Hillel. Gives it more credence that way. <laughs> Rabbi Bradley Shavit Artson and his, the dean of the, your colleague, the dean of the Ziegler School of Rabbinic Studies this week said two very important things. Ask yourselves if you're in the winning camp this year, as opposed to eight years ago, or remind yourselves that you are now responsible for all of us, not just your party. What is hateful to you, don't do to others. Number two is, ask yourselves, why would patriots vote for the other candidate, and how can we begin to listen to their concerns? What was hateful to you, don't do to others. And number three, to remember that hypocrisy is hypocrisy is hypocrisy, and that God can't exist in a conversation that is filled with hypocrisy. If you spent eight years talking about that Muslim non-American, don't expect in the coming eight years for people not to say equally horrific and offensive things about your guy. Don't expect that. What is hateful to you don't do to others. Finally, I think that we need to begin as a country, and now I want to tell you, because I'm Jewish, 
my guilt. My guilt is that I, as an American, and I did learn this from my kiddo this week, I, as an American, have been on the sidelines. As a rabbi of a congregation with a pulpit, I have been on the sidelines, and I feel bad about that. I think that we, collectively, as a congregation, really need to begin to understand that there are people in our country, which means in our community, that are hurting and that are in pain, and we haven't done much about it. It's nice to bring bags of food and non-perishables to Chaparral Christian Church once a year. It's very nice, and they are very grateful at Interfaith Cooperative Ministries for the work that we do, because we provide them about 70% of their annual collection on Yom Kippur. But it's not enough. It's not nearly enough. There are people in pain. There are people who are suffering. There are people who are tired of being tired. And we need to at least engage in the conversation of what we as a Jewish community can do to help. I think it's important for us not to reflect the politicians, to not just give lip service and then ignore them. The Torah demands that we don't just give lip service, but that, as Heschel said, we pray with our feet. I think it's time for us as a congregation to really dig deep and think about what it is that we can do to bring healing to a broken world and to bring goodness and justice and kindness to those in our country who are in pain because I think that voice was heard loud and clear on Tuesday. I actually think this election was a repudiation, a repudiation against everyone who has done nothing but give lip service and then sit on their hands in positions of leadership. And I want to include myself. I think I've done a lot of giving lip service and have done a lot of sitting on my hands. And I think that we don't need to beat ourselves up. We just had Yom Kippur, so let's not beat ourselves up too much. But I think we have to do something. Selim Elohim, being in, created in the image of God, is the ultimate Jewish value. God can't exist in darkness, and there has been darkness. We are divided, and we need to start talking to each other without shutting each other down, and we need to understand that the light within that is God is to be shared with other people, and that begins when we find that light in the other, not the dark. We have to find the light in each other. And we have to identify our own light so that we can share it with others. And so as we go back to the verses of Torah, I would ask you to think about on this Shabbat, the idea of the they turning into an it. Wouldn't it be nice if one of the takeaways from this week was as Rashi taught us, that we as a country will be capable of becoming a single and united entity. Wouldn't that be nice? Wouldn't that be something beautiful to give our children and our grandchildren to spend some time contemplating between now and inauguration, between now and the next election, during the Shabbat. Shabbat is the spiritually charged place to do this, of starting to have that conversation in our homes and in this community about how it is that we can become a single and united entity, and then we will be worthy, worthy recipients of this wonderful democracy, of this wonderful nation, of this blessed life that we have. Shabbat Shalom. <clears throat>